So thank you guys. Uh, today I wanted to talk to you. Uh, I thought I'll make some slides, but then I thought I'm going to tell you how we started Sistanastum. I mean, I've told this many times to many people, but then, you know, um, when you know that how I started Sistanastum, things will be much more clearer than uh, talking about its technique because now the technique is all over the world. People do it better than myself, like Wang, people like Wang, Roy, uh, the Italians, uh, now the Africans. There are many people who started, started it right now and they're doing it very good. I mean, I see videos. So Parthipan from India, so Goyi and Wang from China, these are people who do it really good. So I don't really need to talk about the technique anymore. I don't feel that I should talk about the technique anymore. But um, I wanted to tell you why systemostomy and how systemostomy. So uh, you should know that, you know, I, I did my vascular surgery fellowship from Fujita and I came back to India in 2007 after my fellowship. That was about 12 years back. And uh, that time I wanted to do all the aneurysms. So yes, it's usual for everybody that, uh, you know, you want, you want to do all the uh, aneurysms uh, after a fellowship. So, you know, we used to take up all the big cases as well as the really complicated cases, as well as good cases as well. So for... Uh, if there was a bad bleed, what we used to do was we used to do a decompressive hemicranectomy flap, then go into the cisterns and try to decompress, try to open the cisterns, get the brain lax, and then go to the aneurysm. This is what we used to do. So um, in 2007, I, you know, you didn't have those smartphones mm -hmm. with uh, where you can send images very fast and all that. So. In 2007, uh, I remember my ambulance driver, I was a consultant I, and somebody brought uh, angiogram x-ray image to me. And then I saw the image and I, I understood that is an acorn aneurysm. So I called the consultant who was with me. I told him that I'll operate this right now. So he told me there's one more trauma so I said, okay, fine, you can operate the trauma later. So one hour later, I went to the operating room and I found the large flap. I went inside and I, uh, the brain was rather tense and angry because there's a lot of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I started working on the systems. I opened the interoptic, optical carotid. I don't really remember the sequences, but I opened most of the systems and the brain was lax. Once the brain was lax, then I started looking at the ACOM and I could not find an aneurysm. So I tried and tried and tried for many, many, you know, I, I, it was my beginning. It is not like now. I mean, now I will not definitely panic if an aneurysm is not seen immediately, even after 45 minutes. But that time I was young and I, I was new, so I started panicking. And I told my, the consultant who was with me, I told him, I cannot find this aneurysm. Maybe it's a posteriorly directed aneurysm, which is really difficult. You know, even today for me, is, this is difficult. A posteriorly directed aneurysm is difficult. So I, I said, it's probably posteriorly directed aneurysm. I may have to wrap and come out. So this guy says, no, this is not the aneurysm, it's the trauma. So I got very angry with him. I told him, I, 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 told, I told you to post the aneurysm first. Why did you post the trauma? So he said the trauma, one people dilated, and that was why he posted. But then I told him that I came and I... I started with the microscope and I was dissecting all the cistern and you didn't tell me anything. So he said, you didn't ask me anything. And he was correct. I didn't ask him whether it was aneurysm or it was trauma. So it was my mistake actually. But I was very angry that 
that entire day because I have to come back and I did the aneurysm and then I went back very late in the night. It was my holiday. It was not my duty day. But next day when I came to see the patient, this patient who had a bad subdural hematoma and very angry brain, of course, we removed the bone flap. The brain was really lax, unlike the lot of decompensatory hemicranectomy we saw. The brain was really lax. It was not bulging like the usual decompressive hemicranectomy. It was lax. And not only that, this patient was literally trying to take out his tube. So it, it, I took, looked at the pre-op CT scan. Then I looked at this patient. I couldn't believe myself. I said, there is something here. I mean, we tried to open the cisterns and get the ICP down. And, you know, there is something here. So I talked talk to my chief at that time. And he said, okay, fine. You can go ahead and please remove. Uh, do the large flap, don't put the bone flap in, but open the system. So we started to open the systems like that. This is how we started. And after 50 cases, I was so convinced with cystinostomy that I thought any head injury, cystinostomy is a miracle. And I started talking to everybody. This was in 2008 and nine. I had 50 cases, I went to Cambridge. I wrote to Hutchison and I went to Cambridge and I presented my work in Adam Brooks Hospital. Of course, I did not have any recording. I did not have a proper study. I, my microscope was not able to record. So I had one of, the, one of my people, one of my resident recorded it with the TRV 786 camera, this video camera. He recorded what, I was, what was going on. And, you know, it was crazy, but all the British guys laughed. They told me they had a good laugh because they are the department who started the whole concept of Munro Kelly and big guys in the, uh, in the audience, you know, Adam Brooks Hospital, royalty, neurotrauma, but they laughed. And I did not understand. So when I finished, when, they, when I finished the talk, I asked somebody who's, how is it? How is it? So he said it's very interesting. But my friend who was with me, my British friend who was with me after we went to his home, he said, interesting means it's idiotic. That is British English, British English. If you say interesting, that means it is good for nothing. But at that time, I was convinced that I am not going to, whether it is interesting or it is idiotic, I'm not going to stop it. So Many times people, you know, there was one time when everybody tried to sue me in India. So they, they made a complaint saying that I am trying some new surgery. But thankfully, my, the, some of the senior neurosurgeons, they saved me. They, they called the meeting and between, there was, it was not a big issue, but they called all the meeting and then they told, they asked me, what are you doing? I said, I am doing a decompressive flap. So then they said, it's normal. There is nothing new in that. Then they asked me, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Then I told them I opened the system. They say it's nothing new because in China and Russia and India, earlier they used to do the temporal lobectomy, uncasectomy, cutting tent to let out the CSF. So it's nothing new. So it is published. More than 60 papers are there. So they said it's nothing new. So they said doing decompressive flap is nothing new. Opening cistern is nothing new. And they asked me, do I put the bone flap back? I said, yeah, if the brain is lax, I put it back. So they said that is also nothing new because after taking out a subdural, there is a clause in decompressive hemicrinectomy itself that you can put the bone flap as a floating flap. It is there in decompressive hemicrinectomy also. So now there is a study on it. Okay, it is called the floating bone flap study. But it was there from that time. So the senior neurosurgeons who were supporting me, they told me this boy is doing nothing new. He is doing decompressive flap. He's opening cistern, which was there for very many years. And he's putting the bone flap back only if there is brain is lax. So there is nothing new. There is nothing wrong. So the other guys were very unhappy, but they went home. 
Then they told me not to use the name cystonostomy for some time. So I did not use it. I just said decompressive hemicranectomy with cystonal opening. But after that, things changed, of course. And then I met Goe in 2020. 20, 10, I met Goe, and then Goe invited me to his uh, center in 2011, and I gave the talk on cystinosmy. In fact, it was my first very good positive talk on cystinosmy. It was in China. I will never forget this. So I went to Goe's place, and they were very supportive, and they were very nice. I, then I went to Nanjing, and many hospitals I gave this talk. And after that, of course, I met Wang, uh, in my conference two years back, and he has completely changed things in China. He has gone ahead and, uh, uh, you know, very good technique and uh, very fast and excellent results. And what I did not do, that he, he put up all the ICPs before, ICP after, everything he put up and he did it very systematically so that he was able to kind of prove and convince a lot of people that cystinostomy is actually good. So then the same about Parthiban and Roy. Roy, he was looking after Michael Schumacher. And so he had a lot of attention for head trauma. So when he started, when he started this uh, uh, trial and in Lausanne, every single place in Europe started looking at him. Even the Swiss people started looking at him. The Germans, the, the, the Germans, the French, everybody started looking at Roy and uh, they were seeing if he, he is succeeding. And then he also, in Europe, he, Roy has a major, major role in, in making, the, making it work. And in the same way, Parthiban in India also started this. Parthiban was in, at first very much against this, but... Later, when he saw, like all good neurosurgeons, he saw that it is a good technique, and then he started it. Now we have a lot of fellows from South America, from India, from Africa, coming and learning this, going back and starting it there. And I get many WhatsApp messages from at least two or three WhatsApp messages, every people who are doing it and finding it. And now all my consultants do it, and they are doing it. Yesterday also, they're it's very good, nice and beautiful thing. I, I can probably show you that. But this is how we started. This is how cystinostomy I answer. Now, why cystinostomy? Why? Why is it important? Now, first thing first, you must understand the world is not a rich place. Is not the world is not Europe and United States. Europe and United States forms only one sixth of the world's population. The rest of the five sixths of the world's population is poor. It is called LMIC, low and middle income countries. These countries, the ma the major most impact is in in these countries in neurosurgery. In fact, in any other healthcare scenario. One of the major impact in these countries, that is five, six of the world's population, major impact is head trauma. And unfortunately, we are not using microscope in these traumas. And you know what is our excuse? Our excuse is that the Western people don't use it. They are, they are not directing us to use it. They don't say that it should be used. What a stupid excuse actually. And can you imagine, in this five-sixths of the world, the maximum number of people dying is from trauma. And who is operating? Because there is no need for microscope. Who is operating? The junior most guys are operating. It is a way to learn, uh, uh, you know, to see how to look, the brain looks. So it is ghastly and it is terrible. But when we were first years, we did when we were allowed to theater first and second years, this was the surgery that we did. So no supervision sometimes. They tell, okay, just open and just uh, somehow close it. I'm sure it is the same everywhere in the world. Not just uh, India, but everywhere in the world. I did my neurosurgery in one of the largest uh, departments in India, operating almost 4,000. This is nothing in China, but for other parts of the world, it is big. It is one of the biggest and one of the first centers in Asia. 
very state of the art center. So I did my neurosurgery from there. Even there, the people operating were the junior most. And so trauma patients don't have hope. And when I met Yasa Gil, he was late. I mean, later when I met Yasa Gil, he told his only regret was that he was not operating trauma and he did not use microscope in trauma because it was looked after by a completely separate man. And they, they did not want, so Yasagil had to choose whether it was trauma or microsurgery. For Europe is okay, but for us, our biggest challenge is trauma. If we are good microsurgeons, if we can operate good vascular surgery, uh, let me assure you, your number of aneurysms, five into five is your number of trauma. So why can't we use our resources, our microscope, our microsurgical skills in trauma? This is my question. So is a question that everybody has to answer. Yes, of course, you can use, uh, I mean, as now, I'm not asking that every consultant take over trauma and then the, the junior residents don't get any exposure. This is not right. I understand. But you should have a consultant who's supervising you for the first few cases of trauma, and then you learn how to do this with microsurgical instrument. So you, all your bad habits are gone. Now, I see a lot of bad habits and a lot of fear of malignant brain swelling. People tell me, oh, you have not seen malignant brain swelling, and that is why you are talking like this. It's not correct. We have more than 1,500 cases. We have seen all kinds of swelling. Sometimes it doesn't work, of course. Yes, it doesn't work, but very less cases. If you open properly, if you do your skull base work properly, and not only in trauma, in aneurysms, in bleeds, in any other things, if you try and open the cisterns, the brain will become lax. Believe me. Okay? In basal ganglia bleed, in aneurysmal bleed, in tumors, get into the system, the brain will become lax. The brain will respond. Okay, it's not like uh, ventricular uh, catheter. It's not like it. Okay? It's much, much better. Much, much better response. Okay, so this is, this is my answer to why cystinostomy. We started how cystinostomy. Now my answer to why cystinostomy. And then third, scientific evidence. Okay, now... I'm asking you a question. Imagine, in the base of the brain, you have 120 ml of water. And if you think it was there to just suspend the brain, God must be an idiot. If, imagine the brain is very soft and we know Archimedes principle, so 150 ml of water to suspend the brain. If this was just for that, God must be an idiot. But imagine this water is used for cooling. This water is used for cleaning. This is, our, this is what we wrote in the Springer Neuro Series. How cooling? Because our, all our sinuses are lined with wet mucosa. And when we breathe, we are cooling the sinuses and the CSF collection, largest CSF collection, supracellar cistern, is in the middle of all these sinuses. So by convection, that supracellar system, if you see a temperature measurement in MRI, we are doing this, it is 1.5 degree to 2 degrees cooler. And this CSF gets into the virtual robin spaces. So you must know that all the vessels enter from the cistern to the brain, not the other way around. So these, around these vessels, there are spaces. And when these vessels pulsate, this CSF goes in. It is called the Archimedes screw principle. So you have cool CSF in your cisterns and it is being literally pumped into the all parts of the brain to cool the brain and to clean the brain. The cleaning takes in the night, takes place in the night because of aquaporin four channels. It has been proven now. And cooling takes place all the time. 
not just in the night. Okay, so cleaning and cooling is through CSF and there is a clear pathway from this suprasellar system into the, into the brain. And that is what happens in head trauma. When there is bleeding, subarachnoid bleeding, the pressure in the systems go up and all this CSF gets displaced into the brain and you have brain swelling. So when you have brain swelling, you have to, if you open the swollen brain, the brain is really swollen, and if you open half the dura, the brain will come out. Okay? It will come out for sure. It will hurt it. You are causing one herniation to, uh, to, you know, to help with another herniation. One herniation is deadly. The other herniation just produces a, a vegetable. So you are opting for a vegetable rather than a dead patient. It's not good. Okay? The answer is to go to the base and open the cistern, allow the blood to come out, allow the backflow of the CSF, then this brain uh, swelling will come down. I'm sure Wang must have seen in so many cases and many of you must have seen too. So this is called CSF shift edema. <coughs> we have also written textbook chapters and papers on the cooling and cleaning functions of the brain. If we are doing MRI studies, we have a three Tesla intraoperative MRI right now. So for the last uh, few years, we have been uh, in, in, in this center as well as in Calgary. Calgary, they have uh, experimentally proven the CSF edema. They have published it. And we are also working on the MRI findings of cystinostomy. So these are the scientific evidence. I hope all the surgeons in India, China, Africa, and South America teach trauma to these fellows in Europe and United States. Okay, not the other way around. It is uh, unfortunately all the companies and the money is in these two places. So they tend to tell you what to do in TB and they tend to tell you how to do, how to manage tuberculosis, how to manage trauma, when the number of cases they have is one hundredth of what we have. So please wake up and please uh, make sure that they also, because with our vast experience, we should tell our brothers and sisters in US and UK how to do trauma and how to get away from these bad habits of primitive 100-year-old surgery without microscope and asking the junior most guys to go there without any supervision. Thank you very much. Okay, I uh, very good. Thank you very much. I'd like to take the opportunity for the Chinese neurosurgeons to ask you questions, uh, and maybe Yang Hong can lead that part. Yang Hong, are you there? Hello, Yang Hong. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, could you lead lead the, the people to ask questions of Ipe? Uh, they may have specific questions and they may need uh -huh. some they may need some help translating. Okay. Okay, you, let me could you explain that to the audience that Ipe is okay. ready to answer questions? Let me tell uh Ipe uh, uh, sp uh, speaking something about uh cystosomy. Yeah. Young Chinese. Uh 在以为是前腰的动脉瘤
那么这样的话，就是说他们在思考这个这样的话，我们不去古拜，后期后期就是我们把嗯脑池打开，不去古拜，呃，尝试了这么一些病例，收到很好的效果。那么这样的话，就是说他通过会议来进行一些推广，呃，印度的人啊、呃，刚开始人们说你这人没有什么新的东西，呃，脑池打开，呃，比如说颅底的脑池造漏，这这是一不是一个新技术。那么这样的话，就是说我事实上咱们颅底的还有动脉瘤的这些都有应用这些技术，那么。他就把这个技术应用到脑外场中，这就是本身就是对于咱们呃来讲也是一个创新啊。那么这样的话，就是他在二零一一年在河北，就是郭毅邀请他来再参加他们那个会议。那么这个上就是郭毅最早把他们的科技翻译出来，在咱们的国内的网站上也发表过，就是说通过他的这次来中国的呃讲解，嗯，包括一些南京呀、上海、北京，他们也来开过几道会议。那么把这个理念逐渐的在宣传，啊，当然也包括一些去欧洲呀，去嗯，去印度、去非洲来进行这个学术的推广，啊，这是他做这个工作刚开始怎么起开始的啊。那么再一个就是说，这个外商，外商在包括发达国家也是，包括这个他们都不用显微镜，就是他把这个显微镜的理念应用到外商中。那么这样的话，就是说，包括我们好多的手术，你比如说通过外伤，呃，显微镜显微操作熟练以后，再包括一个颅底的手术，还有一些动脉瘤的手术，我们这这这些手术基本基本的操作和技能都具备了。包括亚萨尔对他的一个肯定，对于这个这项技术在外伤中应用的非常得到了他他老先生的。呃，一个一个肯定，就是说也支持这样的工作在外商中开展，这就是实际上就是最核心的问题，就是一个把显微镜、把显微操作应用到呃外商中去。那么再一个问题就是他讲这个脑界的作用，脑界的循环。那么脑界包括咱们颅底的这些脑界，脑界就是第一个，因为包括咱们颅底有鼻腔，还有这些脑界本身是对脑子是一个是降温作用，因为咱们有有水，脑子是在这个水里面飘的，脑脑子里面飘的。然后包括咱们这个，这是一个降温，再一个还有脑子一个清除作用，呃，清除废物，清除代谢废物，呃，也这个库林和克林宁这这两个作用。这样的话，就是通过我们对于一个脑池、颅底脑池、脑界的一百多毫升的这这些脑界的引流，对于脑子的代谢、对于脑子的循环、对于它的降温起,起到一个很好的作用。他大概讲的就是这么三个内容。当然，我不是详细的、逐字的翻译，都就把这他这个内容总大概总结了一下。那么大家有些什么样的问题，他咱们可以和他去一起去探讨。丽娟，丽娟在不在？郑宁，你有什么问题吗？郑宁。Anybody have any comments or questions about? Question. Long bill. 有些什么问题，赶紧来陪医生讨论。呃、uh, ，I have one question. Hi, Doctor Wang. 嗯。Yeah, it's it's about how does the uh, uh system ostomy affect the gym gym fatigue uh, uh system. 就是这个这个这个就是这个脑池造漏术是怎样影响这个呃这个胶质淋巴系统的？就是之前我看你们讲，就说这个，它它可能是通过这个颅内的废物可能通过这个内淋巴循环代谢。如果我们把这个做了这个脑池造漏术之后，它是怎么影响这个内淋巴系统的？就是有没有这样的研究？呃，它这个脑池造漏是对这个胶质淋巴循环是一个负面的影响。因为外伤以后，我们的对我们的这个胶质淋巴循环，就是说这个外伤以后，这个胶质淋巴循环是功能是下降的。啊，对，这个这个这个是我知道。对，功能下降的。啊，那我们做完这个脑池造漏术，它它会下降的更厉害吗？还是说它？我们做完脑池造漏，等于因为它功能下降，这好多的脑汁液它流不出来，明白吧？它没地方走，只能是让脑子里面因为压力高嘛。脑水肿越来越厉害，为什么咱们的颅压那么高呢？这就是
如果咱们没有坚固这个脑池造络的话，它下降的这部分脑汁液的水水分代谢不出去，这样它脑子、嗯、我们脑子的压力那琢磨想象压力越来越高，而且脑子水肿越来越厉害，这样最后病人最后效果很差，越来越差。那么我们这个脑汁液的，因为它这个胶原蛋白循环功能下降，没法进行脑子这个水的代谢，我们通过造络把它引流出来，引流出来给脑子呃淋巴循环恢复提供一个时间，是这样子的。嗯啊，我们把就是，嗯，有没有有没有类似的这种动物实验或者研究，就是证明我们动物实验有有这样的研究，就是说，就是脑车造了水以后，对，最近我我我在患者上有那个文章，因为我没有时间来进行详细的对那个文章的详细的介绍，他做了一些各个，比如说各个方面的探索，就是对于脑胶质淋巴循环的影响。脑池造瘘完以后，就是对对于脑池，呃，他他这个里面也有脑池造瘘，呃，也对他这个脑汁液循环的影响，淋巴循环的影响，是都有。行、哦啊，嗯，好好，谢谢您，谢谢您，谢谢您、哎，对。赵、嗯、宁，赵宁。这里有对 IP 上的问题吗？呃，脑室引这个脑室引流量的话，我们呃，到底多引流每天引流多少才是合才是比较合适的？然后这个控制到多少的量才能比较安全？然后又不至于引流的过少？呃，这个问题啊，就是说。刚开始我们用一百五到二百，因为咱们每天的脑汁液产生五百毫升，我们引流一百五到二百。那么当然这是一个相对的一个指标，而且后期我们做了一些病人以后，感觉到引流上一百多、二百左右，他这个颅压还下不来。而且这样的话，我们通过这个颅压的控制，你比如说病人现在引流上一百五了，那他。他颅压还在二十多、三十、三十左右，那么这样的话，我们通过脑际的引流可以降颅压，这是毫无疑问的，而且这样的话非常有效的，比我们用脱水药降颅压是效果很肯定好。这样的话，我们我现在就是说，在维持颅压正常的情况下，适当的多引流一些脑际，有时候引流二百五，有有也有引流三百，那么这个量要要关注，咱们医生要一定要关注，不要引流的过多。我们出现过反常的脑栓的，就是说。你一下子引流的太多了，病人颅压本来不高，而且在这个地方你引流的再多以后，他就成为反常反常脑栓，病人反而痛苦大了。因为呢，这个情况下，第一个引流量总的量，我们如果是说他不影响颅压，我们控制一百五到二百左右，这是一个基本的一个一个概念。那么在在如果是说需要病人颅压很高，那么我们要为了控制颅压，你比如说你做了手术了，后期的。呃，为了控制颅压，可以引流的稍微多一些。那么这个时候，有一定保证的颅压又正常，在在十五左右，在这个基础上你，你你引流的稍微多一些，很没有问题。当然，如果你的颅压再低了，这比如说三个五个毫米汞柱了，你再引流上三百，再引流上呃二百大几，这样的话，可能对病人不是很安全。这样的话，就是有有可能我，因为我们也发生过这样的问题，就是反常脑栓，如果引流的脑就太多了。啊，因此这样的，我我现在就这样一个调整，做了这么一个调整，总的量是按一百五到二百之间去考虑，但是，呃，大的原则还要维持颅压的一个平稳，如果不平稳的话，可以通过脑浆的引流，因为这个地方的脑浆引流是很通畅的，通过它的引流来进行一个，呃，颅压的控制，包括咱们就像脑脑室引流控制颅压一个道理。好，谢谢王老师。好吧，嗯，对。Uh, well, I, if I have a question, uh, uh, I'm not a neurosurgeon, but was China one of the first parts of the world that gained gained uh, interest in the cystinostomy? Is did I understand you correctly when you said that? Hello, Professor Appen. I want to ask a question. Um, about the system, tells me how long does the drain tube remain? Uh, when is it removed? Uh, what's your opinion? Yeah, we we put the drain into the prepondine system, 
through the either the optical carotid window or sometimes if the, that window is small, we put it between the, mm -hmm. or, I mean, carotid and the third nerve sometimes, but mostly through the, between the optic and the carotid and it remains in place for five days. The tube is a number eight infant feeding tube. Infant feeding catheter is what we put. There are, you can put a EVD tube also, but what we put is an infant feeding catheter, number eight. And once we put that in, we make sure that it remains for five days and it drains at least 200 ml of CSF every day. But we could keep it at 10 centimeter height so it doesn't over drain. So we keep it at around 10 centimeter height. It usually never gets blocked with blood or anything. It's not like the EVD tube which gets blocked all the time. So it, it generally drains very well because the pons is also a rigid surface and the the clivus is also a rigid surface, so the tube between these two structures, so it generally doesn't collapse or anything. So, uh, so that is your answer. Five days, we keep it. Around 200 ml, it drains, 10 centimeter height, and the location is between the optic nerve and the, and the carotid, or the carotid and the third nerve. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Um, okay, I have a question, uh, Gleb, Gleb, have you done any uh, cisternostomies in Russia since you've been back? Hello, John, hello, hi, uh, glad to be here, so no, to be honest, I have no opportunity to start practicing it, but we been working on it. Yes, and I think that's going to quite a about the future of this university in the modern world. I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on with the sound there. Jamil, sugar. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, uh, Okay, any more comments or questions for Ipe? Now's your chance, guys. Everyone's quiet tonight. <laughs> That's okay, okay. Would you, Ipe, would you say it's more accepted in China than it is in the rest of the world as an option for trauma, head trauma? Uh, well, it's getting accepted in India very well. So, see, India and China forms one third of the world's population. So, whether it is accepted in the rest of the world is uh, immaterial. If these two countries, uh, if you count Pakistan and Bangladesh, India and China, they are almost half of the population. <laughs> yeah. So, so you you put in you put in uh, uh, South America and you put in including uh, let us say Russia, South America, Africa, mm -hmm. and you got more than five six of the population. So see, these are the countries who must accept it. Once it is accepted in these countries then the world will change. There's no question. Nobody can hold it back anymore. So, I mean, a population of 100 cannot, uh, cannot how much of a powerful they, they are, they cannot hold back a million. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. So, I always believe, you know, when revolutions took place, there were always a powerful select few people and then there were a lot of commoners. So we are right now at the commoner stage, we are a lot. And we, we don't want a revolution, we, we don't want it to be violent or anything, but we will teach them, we will tell them this is not the way to do trauma surgery. You should change and maybe your journal's standards should change, your publishing priorities should change. And maybe these industries of uh, implants and, industry, and this trend of not using microscope in trauma should change. And we will teach them all that, slowly. Well, you know, having a whole section dedicated to cisternostomy at the WFNS 
Yes. Um, is that a first? Is that a first to do that? To have a section in a big conference like that? It's of course a first, and thanks to all, thanks to Van that he's arranged it. We are all proud that there will be a sister me session. So we hope to televise it also. This gentleman here is going to tell who is going to help us with that. So we'll televise that. Maybe all my fellows uh, are going to be there in Beijing. So we are hoping that, you know, this. And now even uh, people like Angelos, Hachisan, all of them are, you know, they are helpful. They're true researchers. So what they are telling is, you know, they have seen the impact of it. And uh, now the genome study is uh, put as a, as a primary option. So which is a great acceptance for us. You know? So the world is changing. Nobody is bad or good or anything. It's just that to do a surgical procedure, you need evidence. That's even if somebody, to, if somebody came and told me, that, uh, uh, okay, you do this procedure. It's very good. I will not uh, start doing it immediately. Of course, I'll need to think first whether it makes sense. And after that, I need to see the studies where anybody is done. And then I start. So the world is undergoing that kind of a change right now. And very soon it will change. Well, you, you know, that's the that sister Nasmi section is the very start of the conference. 7.30 on Tuesday, on Monday, right? On the, yeah. on the ninth, very, very first conference. Yeah. Very early. So I urge everyone uh, to take note of that so you don't miss it by the time you sit down. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's a small world, right? Because uh, Tao Zhu, the neurosurgeon that's going to help televise it, worked with uh, Antonio in Cornell. And oh. he, 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 mentioned, he mentioned it to me. He said, oh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, he worked with Antonio at Cornell uh, in his, one of his original papers. Small world. Yeah. Antonio is a very good friend. I met him last in uh, Naples. Last year, I met him in Naples. Um, and uh, he is a very, very good friend. So we wrote Anatomy and Physiology of Systemosomy together. So, no, he, he's going to be there. He's going to be in uh, Beijing, correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's going to be in Beijing. Antonio is going to be in Beijing. Okay, very good. Okay, any more comments or questions? Okay. Then, I'll, uh, I'd rather move. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Gwen, for arranging this, and John for arranging this. Okay, thanks a lot. I'm very happy to be interacting with all of you guys. And good to see uh, Gleb, Sugar, all uh, Bang, John, everybody, okay? Thank okay. you so much. Okay, we'll end this session and we'll start for next. Thanks, I